We're out at the Garden Home construction site where we're building better, not bigger. Stories on being green coming up next. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home. This is a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. As you can see, I'm busy out here at the Garden Home construction site. We've got a lot going on. Now, if you missed the last few episodes of this season, let me get you caught up. For more than 10 years, I've gardened on a 100 by 150 square foot lot in a busy historic neighborhood. Recently, I had the opportunity to acquire a tract of land out in the country, and I've carved out about 20 acres to be used as a garden. I'm really excited about this project because it is a big canvas to paint on. Well, quite literally and figuratively, because we're going to be painting with lots of plants and creating beautiful landscapes. You know, I started thinking about this project and I realized that my past gardens have always been teaching tools, so why shouldn't this one be the same? This is going to be a great project to show how to build and live in a more environmentally friendly way, living greener. Maybe you've heard that song, it's not easy being green. Sure, when Kermit the Frog or Frank sang it, they were talking about the color green and how it blends in so well with other things. But out here at the Garden Home, it's been our motto since we faced challenges. For example, having to wait and wait and wait for the foundation to be poured just so we can get three important eco-friendly systems in place. Now, if we started off on the wrong foot, we would be in a world of hurt later on in the project. So that's why I want to plan in the beginning with the end in mind. It's so important when you're putting together these environmentally friendly systems. Now, what I'm excited about is sharing with you some of these green components and the inspiration behind them. Why don't we get started with this barn? This is what we started with. What a disaster, don't you think? You see, this was the old dairy barn from around 1920 but I felt like we needed to try to keep it here on the property, but it needed a facelift, so we went from this to this. Like the old saying goes, you've come a long way, baby. We reworked this end of the building by changing the roof line, and the entire structure got a new veneer, and the windows were replaced to match the old ones. I tell you, it was quite a project. And when we started working on this barn, I mean thinking about it in the very beginning, I wanted to make sure that it looked great in the landscape, but it was also durable. Now there were two things that helped us achieve this. One is that we changed the siding, and I love this rough texture that we've got here. We've used a board and batten system, as you can see, and I stained it this dark color, but we'll get to that a little later. Now the second component that really transformed this place is up there. It's the roof. Now this is called a standing seam roof. Essentially, the metal panels overlap one another, and at the seams where the panels meet, they form a ridge. And this ridge is rolled over and crimped so that it becomes watertight. Now, what I find interesting about this process is that this method of roofing goes way back to the beginning of the 19th century. In fact, if you drive out into the country, you'll probably run across an old barn or a house with its original metal standing seam roof intact. Many of these roofs can be almost 200 years old. And it seems that a popular color even back then was this color red, which is called tenor's red. It was called this because the tinsmiths of the time would use a combination of linseed oil and a red pigment to cover the roof. Of course, today, when you order these panels, the paint is already pre-baked on, so we don't have to worry about painting them. I think this roof fits comfortably on the building and in the landscape. And the other component about it that I think is really important is that it's going to tie in nicely with a guttering system that's going to allow us to harvest rainwater, not only from this building, but all the buildings on the project. We'll collect the rainwater and use it in the garden. Now let's talk about the color of the barn. Now remember, early on I said that I wanted looks and durability together, function and beauty. Now what we have here is a barn that's been stained, not painted. I could have used a paint, but stain is much more durable. Now when I attended the International Builder Show in Orlando, I stopped by lots of booths and got a lot of expert advice on everything from faucets and air conditioning to doors and even paints and stains. 
What I learned was that by staining my outbuildings, I would not only get an attractive result, but I would be protecting the wood at the same time. Now this means a longer time between treatments and fewer chemicals being introduced into the environment. Steve, there's some impressive changes in the way paint is being manufactured and I guess created. That's absolutely correct. Matter of fact, advances in paint technology have provided us with uh, the ability to, to give environmentally friendly coatings, uh, low VOC. Now what does that mean? VOC is uh, volatile organic content, which ultimately is the solvents in paint. And through advances in technology, we've been able to reduce the amount of solvents in paint, which ultimately gives you better indoor air quality. Is this actually a coating that you apply, or is it built into the, the paint itself? Actually, it's the chemistry of the paint. Now, Steve, there's a lot of concern about mold, justifiably. Um, what do some of these finishes and paints do with regard to mold? Is there any, any effect there? Yeah, actually, um, with some of the advances in technology, we actually have antimicrobial um, properties to them. What that does is it inhibits the growth of mold and mildew on the paint film. You know, Steve, it's really exciting to see all these new products coming out that are actually more earth friendly. Well, the interesting part about it, it's not only the products that are earth friendly, it's also part of the manufacturing process, you know, taking a look at using renewable resources and making sure that our plants are strategically located towards close to the distribution centers and close to our stores so we're not using a lot of energy transporting our coatings across the country. Now this idea of building greener has been around for many years and during the construction of the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Austin, Texas, they went to some pretty extreme measures to protect the environment. The Wildflower Center was built under the concept of total resource conservation and what that means is we did everything we possibly could to protect the land and, and as Mrs. Johnson would say, sit gently on the land and so we protected whole habitats rather than just protecting certain trees. The site planner and the architects worked together from day one to choose locations for the buildings that would have the least impact on the land. We incorporated a rainwater harvesting system into the design of the buildings that we use in the irrigation system when we do need to water our plants. We had a person on site to make sure that the contractors were not pouring paint down into the aquifer. We're in a very sensitive area of central Texas. We're over an aquifer and any thing that gets put onto the landscape runs down into our drinking supply. And so another reason for using native plants is because you don't need any chemicals. They are happy in their native environment. Some of the things that we did for the Total Resource Conservation Project was to collect topsoil from the areas where the buildings were going to be and we stockpiled it off in the back part of the property and then when we were ready to plant we brought that back in so it was the native soil with the native seed bank and organisms and all those things in the soil that are important for the native plants. When I think about the 12 principles of design that I use as a garden designer, I have to say that enclosure is right up there at the top. You see, it creates a sense of intimacy, and for me, it helps divide space in a way that's really more manageable. Now, it doesn't matter if you're creating a small courtyard garden or taking on a large piece of land like this. You see, by creating enclosures, it's a way of dividing the space so it's not so overwhelming. Divide and conquer, if you will. What I've done here is I've used several different devices to divide up the fields. Behind me you can see the four rail fence that defines the driveway and creates a paddock. And here we have a double faced wall in stone, native stone, that creates a separation between this paddock and the entry and that paddock over there, which has become Daffodil Hill. You know, over the years in creating lots of different gardens and dealing with enclosure, I've discovered that when you can use natural materials and materials from the region, it really feels natural. It feels like it's a part of the landscape. In fact, it's the mossy glaucous gray green found in the stones of these walls that provided inspiration for another element in the barn. Let's head over there for a look. These windows were meant to be a different color, but you've probably run into this problem before. You've gone to the paint store, you've taken one of the color fans, chosen a color, taken it home, applied it, and thought, oh no, this is not the color I want at all. Well, that's the case here. These windows ended up being a lot darker than I wanted. I really want to match the color of the lichen, that soft mossy green that you see in the walls and on the trees out here on the farm. Now I'd like
like to take a moment and revisit this idea of divide and conquer. You know, you never know when inspiration's gonna strike. And the other day, I came up with an idea down in the vegetable garden. Come on, let me show you. A few days ago, I was pondering the scale of this vegetable garden I'm creating out here, and I realized that this thing is 60 feet wide and almost the length of a football field, which is colossal. So I want to divide this thing up into separate spaces or garden rooms to give it a more intimate feeling. And to do that, I've come up with several devices. One is to create this series of raised beds. That'll help. But in this space, I wanted a real room-like feeling. So I'm using these espaliered gala apple trees. Now, the pattern you see here is called a cordon. And you have a series of horizontal limbs radiating out from the trunk. Now, the idea is for me to place one here and one here, which will be one wall of the garden room. Then behind me, to the right and left, We'll have another pair of cordoned apples coming up, and then directly behind me, I'll have a garden shed. So the four walls of this garden room will be in place. And then the pattern, well, we'll have that set with these raised beds here on the floor. Now you may be thinking, gosh, I really don't have that much room to grow fruit trees. Well, in my garden in town, I actually have some apple trees planted in a very small space. In fact, before I had to make room for my chickens, I grew about six apple trees in my small garden. Yes, six. Now you may be wondering how I was able to do this. It was all in the type of tree I selected. Let me take you back to the planting of those apple trees and maybe you'll be inspired to try some in your garden. These days it seems like there's more opportunity for buying plants through the mail, whether you're looking for herbs or perennials or even trees. It's a great place to shop. Now, this time of year, if you order something like fruit trees, don't be disappointed when you unwrap them and they look like this, a stick with some roots. They're actually asleep, and there's a lot of potential in this little plant. As soon as they arrive, there's some things you should do. Once you get them unpackaged, make sure that your order is complete, and then soak the roots for at least two hours and no more than 24 in water. Now, this goes for all varieties of fruit trees, but today I'm planting some apples. Now you might think that you'd have to have a lot of room in your garden to grow fruit trees, but that's not true at all. My garden's pretty small. So I stick with dwarf varieties or some of these new ones like this colonnade apple. Just as the name implies, this apple tree grows in a strict vertical column. At maturity, it'll reach eight feet tall, but only two feet wide. That makes them perfect candidates for growing at the back of my vegetable garden in this narrow space against the fence. And there's nothing to planting them. Just dig a generous hole so you can spread out the roots, and when you position the tree, make sure that the bud union, the swollen part at the base of the trunk, is about two inches above the ground line. Now gently place the soil around it and water it in with some liquid fertilizer. Now remember, if you're going to grow apples, you need two varieties for cross-pollination. Now there are many types of these trees, like the columnar apple trees, that are considered space savers. I also grow columnar English oaks. They can grow to a colossal height, and they give rhythm to the walk alongside my garden. Welcome to my design studio. You know, this is one of my favorite parts of the show. It's where we take photographs that you send in and we play around with possibilities on how to modify the landscape. And take a look at this house. This is a really handsome house. Uh, I love the color of it. It's neutral so we can do anything we want with regard to color. But architecturally, you've got this really strong gable here, the gable's repeated here, and then you have these dormer windows that run across, so it looks like another large gable on that side. The other thing I like about this house is that it has a deep porch, you can see here, and I like the stone veneer across the front. Anytime you use natural materials, I think it fits into the landscape so much better. Now, obviously, the front is dominated by this large tree and it looks like the homeowners have gone to great lengths to preserve this tree because this looks like a new house. The tree is very old. My guess is that's a red maple. If it is, you can bet it's gonna have spectacular fall color. Now I've pointed out some things about the house I like. Let's point out a few things that could be changed to improve the composition. I think we need a step here. It looks like there's an attempt at one, uh, best I can tell, where maybe we'd have a path that would come over to what appears to be a gate here. Look at these boulders. There's one here and one here. I like using large stones in the landscape, but they shouldn't just be randomly placed. They should be deliberately placed. And I like to punctuate points with them, say the entrance to a path or along the driveway. 
The other thing I think that could use replacement is probably the mailbox. What do you think? Time to upgrade. In fact, what I would do is choose a mailbox that reflects this post design. Maybe it's a classic white one with just a standard white post with the traditional mailbox. Now just look behind here. You see there's a deciduous tree and there's one right behind it. I think that I would remove these and probably put some sort of hedge here, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Now let's talk about some hardscape changes. Now this would be anything in the landscape that is not green. So we're going to do our hardscape first. We're going to start right up at the front of the house. Actually, we'll start right up at the porch. Now what I like about this porch is it appears to be very generous. I think that having a pair of containers on each side would really accent the entry. And it looks like we have enough room here to maybe have uh, a pair of chairs and maybe a table here to really make this an outdoor living space and perhaps a bench on this end. Now this looks like a dark end or corner where you might have an oversized container. It could be a great place for like a big Boston fern. If you look over here on this side, you can see what appears to be a garage and a driveway that comes up there. I think what I would do is make a path that would come across to this front path, you can see here. I like the idea of dividing the front of the garden maybe with another garden path that would come across like this to this driveway that leads back to the backyard. Now that path could be flagstone and I would echo the stone veneer that they've used here in terms of color and the random pattern. There's so many stones to choose from out there. Now speaking of stones, I think I would move these boulders where you could use them to punctuate maybe the entrance here to this driveway, maybe one here and the other one associated with it. I wouldn't just have one group. Over here on the other side, I would actually do another grouping of maybe two or three boulders. Okay, now let's talk about some plantings. Structurally, I think we need to frame the view. So over here, I would want to put some sort of a hedge, an evergreen hedge. If we could have maybe um, something in holly or yew, uh, even the Leyland cypress might work. We'd remove these two trees as I pointed out earlier. I think on the corner, something tall. Remember, we've got shade here with what looks to be a red maple. We might do a dogwood tree here on the corner in this bed and then echo that over here on this side in the bed on this corner. So that sort of balances the property. As far as planting in these beds, I think I would do a spine of a low growing shrub along this edge of the drive and a spine of hedge that would come in maybe behind these boulders and wrap around them as a backdrop. This could be a dwarf low azalea and maybe carry that same spine across the edge here. So you look over into this space where we might have an oak leaf hydrangea grouping, three plants here, and do another oak leaf hydrangea clump here. I love the creamy white cone-shaped blooms that they have during the summer and the fall color spectacular. Now along the foundation of the house, under these hydrangeas and behind the dogwood, I would do a fern, maybe a southern wood fern across the base in the same way, the same would occur over here on this side of the foundation. And then in this area, I would just fill in with a ground cover. It could be a juga, I love the little carpet bugle, I like the purple bloom, or it could be something like vinca minor. Then along the edge of the path on this side, I'd leave a pocket of planting space for, say, white impatience to echo the white on the house. And then on each side of the front door, I would leave a space for color there as well. Again, impatience would be great, or caladiums. And in these containers, you could echo that same white theme, or you could just put a pair of classic boxwoods or some other kind of evergreen. Then under the tree, where you're going to have problems with roots, I would just do that ground cover all the way out to the street with just a band about four feet wide from the curb where I would lay the flagstones so that when people arrive and they step out of the car, they're not stepping into the ground cover, but they're stepping onto flagstones. Now, the same would occur over here. Again, I think we've got a lot of shade to deal with. From this edge of the drive, I would bring the ground cover all the way across, and then against that hedge would be a great place to plant big groups of hosta, maybe 
one, two, three, four, four groups and maybe five plants per group so you create a rhythm just like you see the rhythm of columns across the front porch. You know, I thought this was such a good house to consider for a virtual makeover because so many of us struggle with shade. And in this case, as you can see, we haven't planted any lawn. We've just done an entire shade garden in the front. Just a few ideas to consider. Back when this was a dairy barn, the owners didn't give much consideration to lighting. But since this building is so close to the house, I wanted to have a finished and more refined look, which includes making sure that we have the appropriate lighting. I really want it to be finished right, and that means adding lighting that fits with the spirit of the place and won't be out of scale with the barn. Now what I've chosen is this classic barn fixture, and the paint color is one that matches the window trim. Now, during a visit to a lighting showroom in Savannah, I saw a wide range of fixtures. I got some advice from lighting expert Gail Singer on how to pick just the right light in terms of style and size for your home. When considering lighting for exterior of somebody's home, you would look at two elements. You would look at the functional element and you would look at the aesthetic element. From an aesthetic standpoint, gas is a wonderful way to bring light to your space. It has a really low light aspect of it. It has no functionality at all, but it's just beautiful. And to have a flame in your garden or at the doors of your home is a beautiful way to bring light in a very low light form. And from the functional standpoint, you need to see if there are safety issues, if there are stairways involved. Also, there are all different kinds of path lights that can be used. They can be decorative and part of your garden. They could also be just totally ambient in a more functional way of illuminating whatever plants and foliage that you have but you would not use gas there. So as opposed to the interior of your house, which the lighting is much more specific, you have a certain room that you need to light in a certain way, or you're reading and if there's a task involved, or you're preparing food in your kitchen, which is gonna take very specific light levels. For the exterior, it's really about the functionality of being able to get through your front door and up your stairs. So really for the exterior of your house, there are certain functional aspects to it, but for the most part, it is about just being aesthetic and beautiful and illuminating your exterior and your gardens so that it's pleasing for your eye. Well, if you hadn't met Atticus and Kit, here they are. They're Belgian draft horses. Atticus is about a year old and he's very curious, which brings me to the fence. You see, we created this paddock and painted it a nice charwood brown, but on the inside, to protect the fence from this little guy mainly, I've run an electric line all the way around. Now, the interesting thing about this is that electric line is powered with solar energy. And these guys are smart. It only took them a short amount of time to learn their boundaries, and now they're very happy in their own little paddock. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have and been inspired by some ways to live greener. You know, it's our responsibility to make choices that are better for the planet. And it can be as simple as choosing the right finish, like the dark stain I used on the barn and even the metal roof, to experimenting with off-the-grid power, like the solar-powered fencing that's in the paddock. Or how about some of those garden-fresh ideas, like growing columnar apples in a limited space. I'll see you next time. And until then, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith.